1820 and 1950, the church was defending itself against the new revolutionary world brought into existence by the French Revolution of 1789. The French Revolution put society, a European society, a society in Europe on different foundations. It put, instead of being founded on the church, it was now going to be founded on democracy. Instead of being founded on God, it was now going to be founded on man. That was the French Revolution. And the French Revolution did its best to pull down the throne and to pull down the altar. Because the throne and the altar, the throne of the king and the altar of God, the Catholic altar of God, went closely together. There was a union between the church and the state. The modern world is turning away from God. It's sliding away from God. And therefore, uh, this process of sliding away from God took a great leap forward with the French Revolution. Because up till then, at least the Catholic countries, the Protestant countries, it, it were already in trouble. But the Protestant countries couldn't slide too far as long as the Catholic countries held. As long as the, as the Catholic countries held strong, especially France, which is always out in front for good or ill. And if, if, as long as France held close to a church and altar, the Protestant countries tugged in the wrong direction, but they couldn't really pull Europe with them. But when France slipped with the French Revolution, then the world ch changed. Uh, what happens in France is important all over the world, always. It's just like, it's like that. It's, it's just a fact. Uh, for good or for ill. French Revolution for ill. Archbishop Lefebvre for good. Uh, the French Revolution meant a new basis for society. And the church had now no longer had the support of the throne, and that's of the state, what we would call the state. Then it was called the throne because the state was the king. The king was the state. And the whole, the king, the whole of the state was a monarchy under the king. With the king Cut, he's had his head cut off in 1793 by the revolutionaries and from then uh, the, uh, the, the, the world was different. From the moment that they cut off the crown, cut off uh, King, King Louis XVI's head, the world was, in, well, the world was in, in a different position. Then, uh, the church had had the throne closely working with it. The state of the church were united. But what the revolutionaries did, the Freemasons, and behind the Freemasons always the Jews, the long, the, the long, long enemies of the church, and they're proud of it. They're, they're not ashamed of being enemies of the church. They're proud of it. They're proud of fighting Christ because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. They believe he's a false messiah and they believe it's their glorious duty to fight him. So they're not ashamed of it. In any case, uh, they succeeded in pulling down the Catholic king and this meant a different situation and the church had to had to now work out how to live in this to work in this very different world and um, it took some time for the church to find its feet so to speak uh, in this very different world uh, The, the, the modern man, as he was coming out of the revolution, let's call him a revolutionary man, was believing now in man, in the rights of man, in and the slogan, the great slogan of the of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. The church uh, early in uh, an example of the problems arose, for instance, with a, a priest, a, a priest called Félicité de Lamney, Father Félicité de Lamney, a French priest, a brilliant French priest, who worked out a brilliant new way of coexisting with the revolutionary world. How the church should, should, should come to a kind of compromise with the revolutionary world. And then, then came out one of the first clear anti-liberal, anti-liberal anti uh, anti and that was uh, Miraribos in 1832. Uh, then, um, and, and the Pope condemned this compromise between the church and the revolutionary world. He said, 
No compromise is possible. The Catholic Church can't change. The Catholic Church does not need to change, and it cannot change. The Catholic Church comes from God. Its dogmas are fixed. They can't evolve. They can't change. They can't adapt. The, the world has to adapt itself to the Church, and not the Church to the world. And that's, he staked out, he staked out the church's position in 1832. It was clear, it was absolutely solid, it was well thought out. It's exactly what the church had always said and would say. Sure enough, he took that position, bang. But ever since then, the temptation has been for Catholics to come to some kind of compromise with the revolutionary world. To mix revolution and revelation. Revelation is of God, of course. Revelation of the two testaments, the revelation of the Bible, the revelation of the church, the revelation of the revolution have got to somehow be fitted together. That is like trying to fit together two and two are four and two and two are five. It's not possible. Two and two are five is a lie, it's nonsense, it's untrue. Two and two and four is the fixed, unchangeable, steady truth. What the church has always taught is just like two and two is four, what, what Lamine taught, what uh, Vatican II taught, what Bishop Philly is now wanting to take the society back to, is like 2 and 2 or 5. It's, it's, there's no arrangement possible between 2 and 2 or 4 and 2 and 2 or 5. 2 and 2 or 4 is true, 2 and 2 or 4 and a half is false, 2 and 2 or 4 and a quarter is false, 2 and 2 or 3 and 3 quarters is false, 2 and 2 are th 3 and 9 tenths is false, 2 and 2 are 4, and that's it. That's how church truth is. It comes from God, it's fixed, it's clear, it doesn't need to change, it cannot change. The Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, is, the, is, the, is our Lord's presence, real presence, real truth, substantial presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It always has been ever since the first Mass, which was the, the Last Supper. And uh, uh, up to now, as, as soon as any priest celebrates a valid Mass, our Lord is there exactly as he was at the Last Supper. That's the Church's truth. It, it doesn't change. It's up to us to change, not to our... God doesn't change. His Church doesn't change. His truths don't change. But there you are, the modern world it itches with revolution. It wants to change everything. It wants to change, you know, it's changing the, the Hail Mary, as I've heard, just heard here and go, now it's uh, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, not pray for our sins, but pray for our family, pray for our this, that, and the other, uh, various other intentions. This mania, this, this craziness to change, because the idea is this, if, if it doesn't change, then it isn't felt. If it isn't felt, it's not real, it's, it, it, it's, it's false. <laughs> it's just not true. I, I can, two and two and four don't, don't change just because I don't feel them. It's not, the, the, our holy religion is not a question of feelings. It's not a question of what's going on inside my gut. It's a question of the truths that come down from my God Firstly, into my head and into my heart, but firstly, into my head. The head is where, where the action is, when it comes to the faith. Because the faith is, in, is seated in the head, the faith is not in the heart. The faith is in the head, primarily, moved by the heart, moved by the will to believe things that God teaches. All right, so the church is trying to, so they began, so the, 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 in the revolutionary world, created by the French Revolution, the, the, there was this constant push towards compromise. And the Catholic Church had to keep on stating, the popes had to keep on stating again and again and again the Catholic position, no change, no change, no possible change. The modern world doesn't like that, the modern world likes change. In the supermarket, new, 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 new soap, new this, new that, new bacon, new eggs. Everything has to be new, and they advertise it as new, and people buy it because it's new. But the church, you, want, you don't want new in the church, you want old in the church. And it's not old, it's eternal, like God. God is not old. God is not young, God is not old. God is eternal. The Catholic Church is not young, it's not old, it's eternal. 
But then this constant push. So the, the popes, you had a series of encyclicals, of encyclical letters by the popes. Uh, an, an encyclical is a letter which, like a kuklos, like a cycle. A cycle is a wheel. So the, imagine the bishops of the world like a wheel. It's a letter which is sent round to all the bishops of the church. That's an encyclical. So there was a series of encyclicals of anti-modern, anti-liberal uh, encyclicals, anti-revolution, anti-anti-anti-anti. People say that the church should be should be anti. The, sh the church should be positive. You can't be positive without being negative. If the, what's positive has enemies, you've got to be negative about all those enemies in order to defend what is positive. By being quote unquote negative, the church is defending what's positive. So don't listen to anybody who say the old church is anti, anti, anti. It's only anti, anti, anti in order to be properly and truly pro our Lord Jesus Christ and his mother and his church. So the, whatever, whatever may seem negative has in fact a very positive basis and a very positive purpose. It's only an appearance of negativity and, and what follows what's positive. The, neg the defense of the truth is like, is following what's positive. In the Second World War, you had bombers and fighters. The bombers were big heavy planes that carried a lot of bombs, flew over uh, enemy territory and dropped the bombs. The enemy, the enemy obviously didn't enjoy the bombs, and they sent up fighters, much lighter planes, attack planes with, do, 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 with guns, to shoot down the bombs. So the bombers are positive in the war because they are dropping bombs directly on the enemy. The fighters are negative do, 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 to stop the bombs being dropped. But if without fighters, you're going to be covered with bombs. So fighters are, the purpose of fighters, the fighters are essentially defensive, the bombers are aggressive, or offensive, the bombs are positive, the fighters are negative, but to defend your country you absolutely need fighters. The encyclicals are like the fighters. They are attacking, they're shooting down the errors of the liberals, shooting down the errors of the revolutionaries. And you've got this long series of encyclicals, and they're magnificent. It's church doctrine for the modern world. Archbishop Lefebvre had believed greatly in the encyclicals, and he believed in having the encyclicals Talked to, his taught to his seminarians because the Archbishop understood the modern world. Um, and he, he, he understood it like the church understands it. The modern world is wrong, it's crazy, it's going off track, and you may experience in the world as you know it today, it's going crazy day by day. Everything in all directions, everybody is going crazy. And the worst craziness is inside the Catholic Church. Because if the Catholic Church doesn't hold then everything, everything slides. If the Catholic Church slides, everything slides. Because the Catholic Church is the light of the world and the salt of the earth, as our Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, and therefore without salt you have corruption, and without light uh, you have darkness. Therefore if the light of the world and the salt of the earth stops being light and salt, the world is in darkness and corruption, exactly as you see today, because the Catholic Church is in such difficulties. It's in difficulties because finally the liberal and revolutionary ideas have got inside, inside the Vatican, inside Rome, inside the very top of the church, so that now the Catholic, the Catholic leaders don't think two and two or four any longer. They think two, two or three and a half, or four and a half, or if you prefer five and a half, or six, or even if you really prefer six million. You know, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It, it, whatever you like, whatever you feel like, what do you feel like? Well, today I feel like five, tomorrow I feel like six. Truth just becomes completely fluid. And this error, this complete loss of truth, was attacked above all by Pius X in Pasheni. This is the... It's, it, Pasheni is 1907, in other words, it's nearly 100 years after the encyclicals began. It's over, well over 100 years after the French Revolution. It's dealing with the modern world, which in 1907, you, if you and I had lived in 1907, you and I might easily have said that it's, there's, there's, no, there's no really great problem. But, the, but Pope knew, saw this little group of priests, it was a little group of priests, and they were, with, with, with another brilliant idea of how to adapt the church to the revolutionary modern world. And the brilliant idea was this. 
How do you make a compromise between the two? I'll tell you what, said modernists. Let's keep all the appearances, but behind will change the reality. The appearance will still be Catholic, but the reality will fit the modern world. And that way we can go on behaving like, we can go on thinking of the Catholics, but really we are in step with the modern world. The Pope was horrified. Pope Pius X was horrified. He was tearing out his hair, almost. Popes don't tear out their hair. They're much too dignified. But if he could have torn out his hair, he would have been tearing out of his, his hair. And if he could have used swear words, of course, Popes don't use swear words. But if he could have used swear words, the encyclical passion would be full of swear words. It's, it's, sometimes he speaks in an anguished way because he realizes that, that this unhooking of the mind from truth this unhooking of the of arithmetic from two and two or four, this making arithmetic depend upon what's in my gut, what I feel like, is sheer madness. To unhook from reality is to launch into pure fantasy. And it's going to turn the church into fantasy. It's going to ridicule the church. It's going to destroy the church. And he could see it. Archbishop Lefebvre could see it, Vatican II, could see these ideas being accepted by the bishops of the church and by the world, and he could see the destruction of the world, of the church. And sometimes when you heard him preaching, if you listen to uh, uh, tapes of the Archbishop's sermons, you can sometimes hear the anguish in his voice of what's happening to the church. He didn't use swear words and he didn't tear out his hair, but by golly you could hear that he was in anguish over the church being completely gutted. The, the, the church being emptied out, all the substance emptied out because it was being changed while maybe the appearances were being kept, but behind the appearances, the, the, being the, the, the um, substance being just, just swept away, destroyed. And so this is the encyclical. Now, I'm, I have to warn you, and it's, it's the longest of the encyclicals of any of them. It's the most difficult. And it's the most important. It's the most important because this is what's happening to the church today. The, the church is being changed. You can see even the Hail Mary being changed. I'm sure you've had the, 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 the Our Fathers being changed. Everything has to be changed. On the principle that it has to be felt. And nothing that I get from my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather, none of that can be felt because it's, it's just automatic coming from the past. So in order for it to be felt by me, genuinely felt, I've got to be a real Catholic. And to be a real Catholic, I've got to feel. <coughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. You've got to believe to be a real Catholic. And sometimes you believe and it's very, very dry. And there's no feeling at all. There's no chocolate at all. But Catholics want chocolate, just like Protestants, like the Charismatics, like uh, all of these modern, uh, all the variations on Protestantism, it's all, it's all modern. It's all, I've got to feel. So, well, what do you think our Lord felt on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? The feelings on the cross were simply horrible. Imagine our divine Lord, the Son of God, saying, my God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? He was abandoned by Peter, by the apostles, he was... He was hit by his friends, he was hit by his enemies, he was, he was completely crushed uh, under the weight of men's sins, our sins, my sins. That's the feeling of a Catholic. It's, it's the cross. Ah, oh, but I don't like the cross. I like chocolate. I don't want the cross. And that's why you have Hashem. It's a system of so unhooking the mind from reality, including the cross, that I then become free to enjoy any chocolate I like. Mangoes, <coughs> chocolate, anything I like, guava, just, and I can sing how I like. There are no longer Ten Commandments. I mean, if I feel like it, I will obey the commandments, but if I don't feel like it, I won't. It's different, it only goes what I feel like. I become God. I say what is right and wrong. I take the place of God. So Pashendi is the, the root of the problem, of the modern problem, of man putting himself in the place of God and the church of man replacing the church of God.
So, it's tough. I warn you, it's tough. Um, I will make it as simple as I can, or as, as clear to understand as I can, um, but it will not be too easy. Um, let me um, <coughs> begin with the, the encyclical. The encyclical divides into five parts. There's an in introduction, there is the doctrine, that's the most important part. Then there are the causes, and he will say that the main cause of modernism is pride. Man wanting to put himself in the place of God, which is the Garden of Eden which goes right back to Adam and Eve. It was the sin of Adam and Eve, pride. They rebelled against God. Causes and then the remedies, which is interesting and it's not difficult. And the main remedy is for St. Thomas Aquinas, the great church, the church's great philosopher and theologian, for Thomas Aquinas to be studied in the seminars, so that the, at least the priests will have their heads straight. The future priests will get their heads straight by studying St. Thomas Aquinas in the seminary. So there, there, and then there's a conclusion. One, two, three, four, and a conclusion. So that's not difficult. Now, the main part is the doctrine. The introduction says, I tried to be nice to the modernists, but they're, they're as bad as ever. It's, I can't waste time being nice to them any longer. I've got to put my foot down and stay as it is. So here's, 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 that's, that's going to be the encyclical. The doctrine is the biggest. And here you've got, firstly, the, the modernist philosopher. Then you've got the modernist believer. Then you've got the modernist theologian. Then you've got the modernist um, historian. A critic. A apologist. And I think that's it. Um, and then the reformer. And the, the reformer, see what he says about, you had this experience of the uh, Ave Maria, the Hail Mary being changed. Um, the reformer, uh, let's see if I can find this. Um, remedies. Let's see. The causes. The causes. 